Welcome to the association's webinar series, where today we'll be focusing on mobile elevating work platforms or MUPS. MUPS assist in making working at heights safer, and over the past few years, there have been many advancements in safety systems and technology, making machines easier to use whilst increasing efficiency and safety of working at height. In this webinar, we'll look at one of the safety features, the secondary guarding system, which is designed to help reduce the risk of crushing incidents. It's good to see so many people here today, so thank you for making time to dial in. We even had to extend our Zoom license because the numbers have gone over 100 people. Today, we've assembled four speakers with a wealth of experience working with MUPS. We've got Ross Bowden and Kieran Grogan from EQSS, who are going to give an overview on the development of their secondary guarding system, and Peter Davis from Coates Hire, who will discuss the experiences of a hire company and how it's adapted with the changes in technology. But first, we'll hear from Andrew Delahunt, the EWPA's Director of Resources, um, to address what you need to know about secondary guarding. We've put together an informative and interesting webinar on secondary guarding, but please be aware the risks are still present and accidents can still occur. It's important to remember to safely use and mute requires planning, training, familiarization and supervision and that the addition of safety features should not detract from these critical factors for safe operation. After this webinar, please visit our website for further guidance on safe practices. The EWPA Good Practice Guide is our most comprehensive free online resource um, and it's available for everyone in the access industry and can be found at ewpa.com.au. We'll have a question and answer session at the end of the presentations but please feel free to use the Q&A function to post questions throughout the webinar. If you have any technical issues, such as audio or visual, please post these on the chat function and we'll do our best to assist you. I'll now hand over to EWPA Director of Resources, Andrew Delahunt. Over to you, Andrew. Thanks, James, uh, and welcome everyone. It's uh, absolutely fantastic to see we've got a, a very large participation today. Uh, we have a, a lot uh, to see today. It's a big program and we're very excited with the speakers we have. Uh, I'll get started and we'll, a bit of an overview on what secondary guarding is and what we need to know about it. Now, MEWPs provide a mechanism to work in elevated positions alongside structures and in confined spaces. And the movement of the machine near fixed objects can place a worker at risk of being crushed or entrapped against an obstruction or structure. So we know that there's a risk there. And th these ac accidents happen in Australia and around the world with tragic results. However, in general, it is impractical to eliminate the risk. The work must be conducted near a potential crash point. So we have to be realistic. If it's impractical, we have to deal with it. Secondary guarding can be utilised to reduce the risk of an incident and to potentially minimise the risk if a, an accident occurs. And do secondary guarding systems work? Uh, my experience, uh, last year I was working at IPAF in Europe and there were, there were some reports about accidents uh, where the MUP operator was crushed. However, they survived. Without the secondary guarding system, it was likely that the result would have been a fatal accident. So, they do, they have been shown to work, uh, but they're not the only solution. Much of what we present today will be, is included in greater detail in the EWPA information sheet, secondary guarding on MEWPs. This guidance has been updated to include the latest developments and it will be published on Monday. So stay tuned. Now, what we will see now is a video and this shows a typical movement that results in the operator being crushed against an overhead structure. As you can see, the operator is, is uh, facing away from the, uh, we go back to that video, we can see that the operator is facing away from the obstruction and away from the hazard. So is a solution to add a secondary guarding system to every MEWP? Well, the EWPA Good Practice Guide provides good advice. 
MUPES fitted with a secondary guarding system should be used where a risk of crashing has been identified. Once we determine the risk, then suitable control measures need to be used. Now there are design protections already built on the MEWP, which may be sufficient, especially if the probability is very low. If not, then a secondary guarding system would be required. As with every decision, when we want to work safely, we first need to undertake a risk assessment and consider the work environment, the type of MEWP and the activity required. So let's, let's take a look at what is secondary guarding. Right? If we take a look at the background, we see that in the first decade of the century, from 2000 to 2010, there was a growing focus on crush incidents. In the UK alone, between 2003 and 2009, there were 13 fatal incidents. Rental companies started to develop devices to protect the operator. And in 2012, the UK major contractors mandated additional protective devices on boom lift MEWPs. 2013, we introduced a new term, secondary guarding. Uh, to emphasise that the devices do not prevent entrapment, so that the use of the term anti-entrapment was a bit misleading. Instead, secondary guarding recognised that there were existing design controls, and this was a new system that would um, be able to guard and reduce the risk. In 2015, the EWPA released the guidance on secondary guarding for, ME for MEWPs. And in 2016-2017, we saw manufacturers, MEW, mute manufacturers, provide secondary guarding systems on their machines as standard equipment. So in Australia, obviously in the last five years, the number of fatal accidents has raised awareness on this risk. But what exactly is a secondary guarding system? It's typically descri described by its purpose, to reduce the risk of a crushing incident. What it is and how it functions is not defined. There's no legislation or regulation or standard that details secondary guarding. And this is something that Australia can lead on. The British standard, uh, if we look overseas, we see the British standard BS 8460, which is a safe use of MEWPs, which was published in 2017, put forward a definition for both primary and secondary guarding. This new term primary guarding was introduced to recognise the existing design protections. Well, I guess it's, it's easy to describe what it's not. Primary guarding is a function enable button, i.e. the dead man pedal, the foot, the foot switch or the joystick trigger. Personally, I don't think this is adequate as it doesn't cover all of the design protections that are on the MEWP today. But, uh, it's easy to describe what's secondary guarding. It's a device fitted to further reduce the risk of entrapment and provide an alert that the entrapment has occurred. It doesn't describe what it is, what it does. So it only is what, the, what it aims to do. So we have an open definition. And this can be a trap in not understanding how the system works and how it protects the occupant. Or by you employing a system that doesn't adequately reduce the risk. So we have to be very um, have to be very knowledgeable about how we use secondary guarding. We need to remember that a secondary guarding system will not completely, completely eliminate the risk of entrapment or crushing. Now, perhaps we now move on to how we assess and select secondary guarding. If we talk about risk, we know that a thorough risk assessment must be undertaken for each job. I would like to emphasise some of the risk factors that do increase the likelihood of an incident. Obviously, travelling near doorways and under structures, and that's applicable for boom lifts and for scissor lifts, uh, would be positioning the platform within confined spaces, or repetitive positioning of the platform, as we see in the image here. And there's poor operation of the MUP, either moving jerkily or at unsafe speeds, a loss of spatial awareness, or selecting the wrong controls. And the last uh, risk I'd like to address is complacency. And we'll go into a bit of detail later. Selecting a secondary guarding system 
we have the EWPA information sheet, and now that's updated, it provides guidance on how to determine if a secondary garden system is required and what to consider when selecting the system. It's based on the risk assessment, how the, the mute that is to be used and the worksite itself. Uh, to help with selecting the right system, we can look at the different types of, of secondary guarding and how they function. But we have to be very aware that not all the uh, that not all types of MUPs have secondary guarding systems. We see in the image the boom lifts and scissor lifts. Uh, in this image, there are available uh, for boom lifts, and they're also recently available for scissor lifts. It does take significant time for fleets to be upgraded uh, with a system. At present, secondary guarding systems are not ready, readily available for rough terrain scissors, vertical mast lifts, spider lifts, trailer lifts, truck mounts, and band mounted boom lifts. We do know that some manufacturers have systems that they are uh, developing, and so the availability may come over the next few years. It also should be noted that there are are a low number of crash accidents on these type of MEWPs. It may be that the risk is substantially less than when operating a boom lift or a scissor lift. So let's look at what we can categorize the secondary guarding is in five different types. Okay, we should see the types now. Uh, it makes it easy to describe each system and how it functions. What we, we ask is we choose the right type of system for the MEWP selected and for the task to be undertaken. Not every secondary guarding system will be suitable for every, every job. And simply put, you know, the different systems have different functionality. What we need to consider, does the system protect the platform controls or the wider platform area? If the system is engaged for all MEWP movements, especially with lift and travel. If the system is engaged only with the platform elevated. And when activated, does a stop movement, retract the boom or prevent further movement? And how the worksite is informed if the, this system is activated? Are there lights, are there buzzers? How can the worksite be informed? And how can it be overridden, especially from the ground controls? And this last, point, this last point highlights that familiarization is key. The operator, the ground crew, the spider, the site supervisor, they all need to understand how the safe secondary guarding system functions and will activate. Every MEWP is different and every secondary guarding system will be different too. I'll also now take the opportunity to brief everyone on what's happening overseas and what the international activity is. Reducing crash accidents is still a major focus in other parts of the world. Uh, we know in the UK, the Strategic Forum for Plant Safety, which is a construction representative group, are updating their guidance, avoiding trapping and crushing industry. Now the EWPA are in strong, close contact with this committee and will be sharing the document here in Australia when it becomes available. In the US, uh, the ARA are also developing guidance. Uh, and in France, the government regulators are reviewing the need for specific regulation. And perhaps most in interestingly of all is in the UK, where the, the Health and Safety Executive, which is the equivalent of Safe Work here, so the HSE have a research project identifying the prototypical movements that result in a crash incident. And we saw one of the scenarios that they've identified, we saw one of those scenarios in the video at the start of the presentation. And again, the EWPA, we're working very closely with the HSE for their project. And finally, I'll just quickly would like to address complacency. Right? Is there a problem with having confidence that, these, that the safety systems do control the risk? Well, when we, when we look at complacency, we say, this safety system ensures we comply to the rules. But is it the best practice? There's an example here of this road roller, multi-roller and a safety program installed proximity sensors. Prior to the update, the road workers pushing the bitumen would stand six metres away from the roller and they would be watching all the time and moving away when, it, when the roller came closer. Once they installed the uh, LED systems 
uh, that alarmed when the people within the detection zone, the workers started standing much closer to the roller and they stopped looking back and to identify where they were. They had complete faith in the system, in that safety system. And they became so confident and the trust that if something went wrong, there would be, would be accidents. So we need to remember that secondary guarding system alone must not, solely be, must, must not be replied upon solely to protect the platform occupants from harm. We need proper planning. We need the appropriate MEWP training, such as a yellow card, and we need specific familiarisation and supervision, which are crucial for working safely. That's what I have, have for. Now I have the pleasure to hand over to our next speakers. We have Ross Bowden and Kieran Grogan uh, from the EQSS. Now Ross is a Managing Director of Equipment Safety Systems, and commonly known EQSS, and he's been at the company for 10 years. Ross aims to utilise the EQSS electronic and software expertise and keep developing unique products for the high and rental construction and mining industries. Uh, under Ross's guidance, EQSS operates out of its new purpose-built factory in Victoria and it plans to expand and no doubt they will. Kieran, on the other hand, has been one of the, was one of the company founders of EQSS and has been there for, six, for the 16 years. As a chief engineer, he leads the design and implementation of safety critical electronic systems. Uh, Kieran works in conjunction with OEM engineers to develop creative, creative and unique safety solutions in the access industry. We look very, very forward to what they have to offer. So Kieran and Ross, it's over to you. Thanks, Andrew. Good on you. Thank you, Andrew, and good afternoon to you all. EQSS has been in business for over 15 years now. Uh, we are an electronic and software engineering company with a footprint in machine safety devices. We design, develop, manufacture and distribute safety systems for machinery used throughout the world. We have developed systems for telehandlers, wheel loaders, boom lifts, scissor lifts, rollers and a number of other machines used in the construction and mining environment. We commenced developing secondary guarding solutions around six years ago and it has been an evolutionary process ever since. EQSS have developed systems utilising various forms of technology during this period, including ultrasonic radar and positive pressure magnetic devices, all designed in some way to protect the operator and avoid serious injury or death. We face many difficulties in the development of the various systems, such as where to place the components, limiting the size of the unit so they don't impinge on the operator, protecting the whole area around and above the platform or basket, and of course, cost. In an effort to come up with the best possible solution, we did an enormous amount of research, not only in Australia, but worldwide, gathering data on accidents and incidents involving scissors and booms, trying to ascertain the causes or situations the operators or machines were in when the incident occurred. To do this, we worked with a great number of stakeholders, such as the IPAF, the EWPA, the OEMs or manufacturers of the machines, high and rental companies, small end user businesses, and of course, operators. Overwhelmingly, it came down to the fact that they all wanted something that ensured the operator was protected and was cost effective. After a number of systems were developed over the last few years, many lengthy trials and from further discussions with the main stakeholders and operators, we came to the realization that instead of focusing on the many hazards around and above the machine, we should be focusing on the most important factor in secondary guarding, and that is the operator. It was then that we were able to start developing what was to become our overwatch. Once again, the main priorities were protecting the operator, giving him the freedom to operate the machine as normal, not impede him in any way from operating the machine in a safe manner. The way he was trained, leave the rails clear to work over and around, and just as important, to be cost effective. 
Once we got the technology right by utilizing recent developments in LIDAR sensors, it was a matter of the somewhat difficult task of writing the software and algorithms that enable the operator to use the machine as normal, but ensure that it cuts out before the operator is seriously injured or killed. To do this, our system works on the premise of detecting the operator's position and movements with respect to the direction of movement of the machine. And obviously we'll only sense these movements when the machine is going up, down, backwards or forwards. That is, it looks for an opposite movement. As mentioned before, we've used all the latest technology available in developing our proprietary overwatch system. Using a powerful Wi-Fi enabled processor and advanced sensor fusion algorithms to give the owner and or operator access to all the information, movement logging details and, and or data they will require for maintenance or safe operation of the machine. Because we control every step of the design and development process of these systems, that is the concept, circuit board design, hardware design, circuit board loading, writing of the software, some of the manufacturing, assembly and rigorous testing, we assume full control of the quality along every step of the process from design to finished product, thereby ensuring confidence of customers and end users in the product. In finishing, can I just say a big thanks to a number of companies who either assisted, advised, provided machines, or just generally supported us in the feedback, with feedback during the development, trialing and distribution stages of the Overwatch launch. Custom, uh, companies such as Coates Hire and Pete Davis, Skyreach, WorkSafe Victoria, CPB, Keith Clark at Hallett, Gijack, Snorkel, JLG, Genie, and Wynn Wilkinson, just to name a few. For more detailed information on our Overwatch system, please go to our website, eqss.com.au. And thank you all for your time today. Stay safe. Terrific. Thanks, Ross. Uh, I have some questions here. First one I'd say is, how important was a risk assessment in, in develop, designing a secondary guarding system? I'll head over yeah, here. I'll answer that one. Um, well, that's a really good question, Andrew. I mean, um, any type of risk assessment is, is really important and critical in the design of any safety related system. I guess the first step uh, after the design concept is to assess the risks that the system will mitigate and determine the required system architecture based on the ISO 13849 standards. So before we can uh, assess a risk, we need to make sure that our technology will mitigate the risk. Um, with the Overwatch system, for example, uh, the architecture requirement was determined to be a performance level C system, which after we determined that performance level, we're able to design the system accordingly. From concept to prototype and production, the system is assessed through the design life cycle. And in the example of the Overwatch, uh, we use the EN280 standard as our benchmark. We conducted internal uh, risk assessments, third party risk assessments by third party engineering firms effectively, um, and also invited uh, OEMs to conduct their own risk assessments at their overseas R&D facilities. It is important during a risk assessment to consider all possible risks and the flow on effects of implementing any additional safety control systems, as we don't want to introduce additional risks to the operator. When designing and implementing a new concept, we, you know, we really need to be aware of the overall use cases and consider how any automatic functionality might potentially be misused, exposing the operator to additional hazards. For example, you know, uh, the application you mentioned before with the roller um, and ultrasonic reverse sensors in cars these days, uh, drivers will jump into a car and reverse without thinking and wait for the system to, uh, to alert them. And there always comes that one time where the system misses it and there's an accident. 
So the system should never replace proper operating training, proper operator training and, you know, standard job risk assessments. Uh, we constantly evaluate and update our risk assessments with additional information as becomes available from feedback industry, use cases and, you know, in-field observations. Reducing, uh, reducing risk and we, to reduce risk further, we constantly adding additional functionality and engineering controls. And it's, it's really an ongoing exercise for us. Yeah, totally agree. That's a, it's a good summation there, uh, Kieran. You, you mentioned uh, a few different technologies. I guess you had a, a number of different uh, concepts that didn't survive and before you produced the Overwatch. Yes, yes, Andrew. Um, my laboratory is filled with uh, prototypes that seemed good at the time and they just didn't work out in the field. Uh, three main types of technologies available. Uh, we have ultrasonics, okay. Ultrasonics are good. They're good for large, large objects, uh, metal objects, reflective surfaces, okay. When we start looking at work sites, we have uh, a lot of objects that aren't very good at reflecting sound. Glass, for example, ultrasonics doesn't really work very well on that. And also on work sites, we have a lot of additional ultrasonic noise that is produced by equipment, circular saws, jackhammers, etc. And these interfere with the sensors uh, to some degree and uh, degrade their detection efficiency. We also investigated alternative technologies um, such as uh, uh, 3D uh, stereo cameras, um, you know, but yeah, they're, they're sort of good in a use, but we've also got to keep in mind the, the economy, you know, the economies of actually fitting a safety device. We don't want to put a $20,000 bit of kit on a $15,000 machine. It just, it just doesn't work. So, you know, safety, safety should be uh, something that is uh, readily available and, you know, economically available for people to, to comply. In Australia at the moment, we have no standard. We have no standard. And people are taking, taking this, uh, these systems up purely because it's, 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 it's a cost effective, it's a cost effective solution. And that's one of the primary design uh, considerations that we have in any system is, is, is making something affordable to the market. Okay, thanks, thanks Kieran. Very, um, and to be clear, there's the MEWP design standard, AS14.10, but it, there's no requirements or uh, stipulations for anything for secondary guarding. Sure. So you're correct there. Thanks again uh, for Kieran and Ross. Uh, I'll now move on to our next speaker, Peter Davis. Uh, and Peter has over 35 years of industry experience. At Coates Hire, he's accountable for the life cycle management of the entire fleet, uh, entire fleet. Not only that, Peter also volunteers as the EWPA Technical Director of Operations. He's a member of the EWPA board and has been a member of the Australian Standards Committee representing MOOPs for over a decade. So over to you, Peter. Thanks, Andrew, and, uh, and hello to everybody online. Good to have the opportunity to speak to you all. Um, I thought I'd start with some just some general comments uh, about our approach to improvement in design and safety of the equipment, which is very much aligned to when our, our, a hazard is identified, we work with equipment manufacturers to either rec rectify the issue on existing equipment or design the hazard out in future build models. Um, and if the issue is relatively minor, this process can be resolved in weeks or months. However, more often than not, uh, the issues are complex and can sometimes take a lot longer to resolve and sometimes it can take years to resolve. I fully endorse this approach and over the years have seen many uh, hazards mitigated by improved design. And this is a balanced and logical approach and meets our obligations as an owner and supplier of equipment. However, what I'd really like to talk to you about today is it's what happens when it becomes more personal and more emotional. So back in 2014, a co-tire boom lift was involved in a fatality in New South Wales. Our machine was not at fault. 
but it was involved and, and I was heavily involved in the subsequent investigation. And for anybody who's been in a similar situation, you'll know that you really can't help but become emotionally involved when someone doesn't get to go home to their families that day. The incident occurred around the same time that secondary guarding systems were uh, for boom lifts were being introduced or starting to be developed and trialled in Australia. However, uh, they were not yet approved for use as there was uncertainty as to whether or not these systems were an alteration to design and required new design approvals from regulators. So therefore really nobody had started to fit them. They certainly weren't in wide use. We as a business took the incident very seriously and, and Coatside took a strong stance and committed to installing secondary guarding on our entire fleet of booms, which we completed that in 2018, so four years on from the incident. Um, in November of that same year, so 2014, as most of you will know, uh, an incident occurred on a scissor lift in South Australia, which also resulted in a fatality. This time it was not one of our machines, but we were still concerned, very concerned with, with how we would mitigate a re reoccurrence of, of that happening. And, but this time it was different as there was no secondary guarding solutions available for scissors. And really this then began what has been a six year journey for me and, and for look a hell of a lot of other people on this call. Um, and that was to help come up with a solution. This journey has included various countless discussions with manufacturers and third party designers, including visits to the global head offices of many of the OEMs around the world to relay the importance of the issue here in Australia and, and to apply an appropriate amount of pressure on them. Um, we've been involved in providing consultation and advice on design. We've conducted numerous trials, um, including some with Kieran and, and, and have contributed to the, the pile of, of gadgets that he might have in his storeroom. Um, and many of them were not successful as Kieran has said in that first couple of years. In this time, we've also contributed on international standards committees for improvement in design of controls. Um, we've also, during this whole period, there's been no real prescribed legislative requirement for secondary guarding, but there's been recommendations coming out of the investigation and in, uh, inquest reports related to the two fat, uh, fatalities to consider using secondary guarding systems. We've also had many discussions with construction and mining businesses, both through Coates Hire and through the association. I've been involved in those as with many others. A few of the construction companies have also been very active and proactive in lobbying and even helping to develop secondary guarding. And during this time, the association has further developed yellow card training. Yet for me, we still, for all of us, we still witness sites where MEWPs are operated by people who have not been trained or who have received some sort of training, but many, many years ago. And MEWPs have changed a fair bit in the last decade or so. Additionally, during this same period, we have seen no change to high risk work licenses. And by that, I mean, you still only need a HR license for boom lifts over 11 metres. Um, what an out, dated and, and in my opinion, just my opinion, frankly absurd approach to licensing and training in this country. You need a high risk license to operate a forklift regardless of any size, but with an MEWP, if it's a boom under 11 metres or a scissor lift of any size, that's okay. Duty of care is all you need. Yet we push on. So 12 months ago, after reviewing a number of secondary guarding systems available, I made the decision to commit to a program to install available the systems that were available to scissor lifts. Because in all honesty, I was frustrated with how long this was all taking. And that decision was supported by the rest of um, our executive team and also by our board. And, and in April this year, or this year, we began to retrofit our existing fleet. Of, uh, of scissors and also specify the systems on, on new equipment. Now fitting these systems comes at a cost. Kieran spoke about the cost and I believe that cost burden needs to be shared by manufacturers, owners and end users. users. Right now um, and traditionally in the rental industry, um, there's always pressure on price, but right now there's extreme pressure 
um, downward pressure on rental rates. A lot of that is caused by COVID, the lack of activity in the business, the glut of equipment in our, in our fleets that's not going out on hire. Um, these systems need to be cost effective. We can't afford five or $6,000 systems fitted to small electric scissors. I'm actually not sure we can afford five or $6,000 systems fitted to any of our machines. But even with the, uh, the $1,000 or the $2,000 systems, we need to get a return on the investment. Customers will need to pay more for, um, for equipment fitted with these systems. We have chosen the EQSS Overwatch system for our scissor lifts, um, but we're open to alternatives as they come onto the market. I think what EQSS have achieved is fantastic. Um, it may not eliminate every possible risk, but I'm confident that their system and other systems currently available will one day save someone's life. And, and it's likely that we'll never even know when they have. That's the beauty of this. Um, they're a system um, that will silently do their job and hopefully we will never be notified of a, of a fatality on a scissor lift again. Um, thanks, Andrew. That's probably a wrap for what I, I wanted to talk about, the experience from a fleet owner, the challenges that we're going to have um, and that we have had, the journey that we've taken and all of it. It's not just about Coats Hire, it's about every rental company is in this same boat. And I'd like to thank the association as well for the, for the support that they've shown and the leadership they've shown on this issue over that last five or six year journey. So thank you. No, terrific. Thank you, Peter, for your um, the great, great little insight into what it's like at a hire company. Uh, I guess from your experience, and, and you've talked about a lot about the cost issues uh, and the barriers, would you still advocate secondary guarding? on every MEWP? Oh, look, I think that's gonna depend on the application. And, and by that, I don't just mean you know, where it's used. I mean, I think if you're an end user who owns um, an MEWP um, and operates as an example in a warehouse with no overhead instructions, you may not need secondary guarding as the environment and the type of work um, is relatively stable. But if, if you're sort of a steel fix at working in and around structures, which will change as the construction you know, progresses, then in my opinion, that warrants secondary guarding, regardless of the type of ute that it is. I think also if you've got a, a more transient, you know, for want of a better word, a transient workforce of, of, of people coming in and out of your site, or you have multiple machines on site, then again, um, secondary guarding would be appropriate. I think the big challenge is also for the rental fleet owners, um, we don't always know uh, what application or environment our MUPs are gonna be operating in. We also know, uh, unfortunately, but it's true that many incidents happened when operators fail to use the equipment safely or correctly. So therefore, in my, my view, um, installing secondary guarding on all MUPs regardless um, is probably appropriate. But in the end, I think it's going to, I think it's really going to come down to the quality of, of uh, each PCBU's risk assessment and also their acceptance of risk because there's risk in everything that we do. But I think that's really what's going to de determine how each business needs to approach this. Uh, for me personally, I think I've made it pretty clear where I, I stand. I've made my mind up that secondary guarding reduces risk and, and I'm really committed to installing it to our, you know, 4,000 odd scissors lifts that we have. I mean, that, we won't be able to do that overnight. I, I, I spoke about the scissor lift, uh, sorry about the boom lifts, and it was four to four and a bit years. I, I think we're in for a similar journey um, with scissors. Um, but I, I am confident that just like boom lifts, um, secondary guarding will become the norm on, on scissor lifts um, within the next few years. Now, whether or not they're the systems that we're seeing now, um, or whether they're more integrated into the machine through the OEMs. So like I said, I think, I think the EQSS system is a great system, um, but I'm really looking forward to the continued development of, of the systems um, and, the, and the full integration, like what we've seen with vehicles um, uh, over, the, over the coming years. Yeah, thanks, Peter. For sure, uh, we see it for the systems used on boom lifts. Uh, the changes in the development over the last 10 years has been quite uh, quite significant. 
and we expect that to occur for scissor lifts and, and also all the other types of MEWPs. Yeah. Uh, Trivik, thanks very much again for your presentation and uh, providing your ex experience and expertise. Thank you. Give you an opportunity, give everybody uh, who's listening today an opportunity to answer, um, to ask some questions and we'll answer them uh, across the board. Uh, but first I'll just, uh, so if you've got any questions, please go to the Q&A section down the bottom of the, your screen and type in your questions there. Uh, while you're doing that, uh, I'll take the opportunity to, to we'll show on the next slide, uh, the EWPA information sheet, uh, which is a secondary guarding. Uh, it's been revised and updated with all the new developments. And we've got the industry experts. Uh, we big thank you to everybody who's taken part in that development of this new document. Uh, we're looking very much looking forward to being able to release it on Monday. So I do urge everyone who is attending this uh, uh, webinar today to take the opportunity to read the, the document and share it throughout their, their company and their, in the workforce. So big thank you to there. We'll now move on to the questions. Uh, and there's a few that have come through. The first one I uh, will go to is, perhaps it's a, a question to Kieran is to ask, uh, regarding secondary garden systems, is there any redundancy uh, if the sensors fail to detect due to the environmental factors? As obviously these environmental factors vary depending on the different types of industry. Uh, so Kieran, can you answer that, mate? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a really, really good question, Andrew. Um, you know, within any type of uh, with any any type of uh, system design based on the ISO 13849, when the Overwatch was designed to performance level C, performance level C uh, pretty much stipulates that not one single fault will cause the loss of the safety function. So in that design, we need to look at redundancy of electronics, okay? And make sure that the, uh, the electronics, if it fails, a failure is detected. And if a failure is detected, the safety function is engaged. And in terms of the overwatch, the safety function is uh, basically uh, applying the dead man. There is redundancy uh, within the system and we are able to detect if there has been a failure of the sensor. Uh, the sensor um, basically outputs the operator's position, his, his speed, his velocity, and his acceleration with respect to his position in front of the operator control box. Uh, our, extensive in, uh, our extensive in field and in factory testing um, under conditions, uh, for example, extreme temperature conditions from negative 30 to plus, plus 70 degrees, you know, the application of, um, of ice, snow, dust, you know, extreme dust, some, some um, test run is, is uh, uh, dust particles that we might experience up in the Pilbara, for example. Uh, and then we've got the uh, environmental conditions, just such as normal wear and tear from uh, weld splatter, for example, on the sensor. And, and what we've done is we've, uh, we've made sure that our system operates within, within those environments. And if there is any um, uh, degradation to the, to the sensor itself, we are actually able to internally detect that in the sensor and uh, either prompt the operator to clean the to clean the sensor, or disable the system completely. If the system is disabled, uh, we are able to have an override, a fifteen second override function to to get the machine back in the stow position and, and basically call for tech support. Thanks, Kieran. Uh, there's a reason why you're the chief engineer. Uh, nice detailed question. I'll move on. Perhaps to James might be able to answer this one. Uh, and Peter had alluded to the involvement of the EWPA. So what exactly has the EWPA uh, been involved in over the last few years? Yeah, look, thanks, Andrew. Um, so the EWPA has worked closely with the state regulators and industry stakeholders. And I'd like to thank all the members who volunteered their time um, on those various working groups. Um, we've been able to provide feedback and input on guidance notices 
Um, Victoria produced a code of practice, which is nearly um, ready for release. Um, we've done quite a lot of work on incident uh, accident analysis um, and even the coronial recommendations, um, but also letting people know uh, what's available currently on the market um, and, and how the system works is just sort of what we've been going through today. So that's, how, that's what been our involvement. Um, we've also got very good connections internationally. We know that the big OEMs are based uh, you know, in the US or Europe, uh, and now we're seeing some in China as well. So we're, we're definitely um, speaking with those guys um, and looking at uh, yeah, the, the existing uh, systems and uh, perhaps what's, what's coming in the future. Oh, great, thank you, James. Uh, now, I'll probably put this question to Peter, if you don't mind. Uh, the question is, is it secondary guarding which suggests prevention, or is it secondary warning which suggests alerting the operator? To take myself off mute. Yeah, look, great question. Um, one that I uh, wrestle with too. Well, I think secondary, the term secondary guarding has come out of international standards terminology. I, I'm not sure it's the best way to describe uh, these systems. I think there's a couple available right now um, which which do alert um, uh, and others do do guard. But I've sort of started uh, referred, referring to them more as operator protective systems rather than getting hung up on, on guarding, secondary guarding, uh, the term secondary guarding. So I think it'll really depend if you look at some of the systems that, that we've got, um, you know, the physical one where it, 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 it is, uh, you know, you, you activate some sort of pressure switch and you, that, that, indicate, that, that cuts out the machine. I think that's, that's a guard. Um, I think others, um, maybe like the EQSS, I'm not sure it's just a warning system. It's, it's something different again. So for me, I don't know if I've answered that correctly because it's, it's a tough question to answer, but operator safety you know, protection is what this is all about. So as long as the system does that, I'll, I'll be pretty happy with it. Yeah, thanks, Peter. It's, yeah, it's, I guess we, we realise where secondary guarding came from as a term. Like it was in 2013, it was introduced uh, from the UK. And prior to that, the terms had typically been used were anti-entrapment. So, so the term secondary guarding was put in place uh, before a lot of the devices were actually developed and yeah. you know it reached maturity on the market so that's perhaps why it is it can be a bit misleading um, i've got a few other questions to go through um question does overwatch check for and reduce potential for hand crush if operator's other hand is placed on top of the handrail of a scissor you know, I guess generally when we're talking about secondary guarding systems, they are about protecting the operator from being crushed and the body or the head being crushed, not hands. But maybe uh, Ross and Kieran, you might be able to say whether the Overwatch is particular covers the hand as well. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, basically, the Overwatch is to is uh, is developed to sense the operator's movements the, the movement of the body so depending where if if the operator's hand is uh, on the rail yes the operator's hand uh, may get crushed in those type of crushing incidents of a of, of a you know of, of i guess not your chest um you we would experience a high velocity movement with the operator the operator would, would, would most likely jump you know, and, and make an erratic movement um, is which when the uh, when the velocity and the acceleration um, detection part of the Overwatch will come into place um, and uh, and potentially stop the machine from um, from uh, applying more positive pressure onto the onto the crush point. Thanks, thanks, Kieran. Uh, and again, perhaps one for Peter. They're coming through these questions. We'll only have a couple more before we finish up. Uh, Peter, the comments regard uh, is in regard to competent person. Uh, who is deemed as a competent person in the case of maintenance, commissioning, decommissioning of a secondary guarding system? Um, whoever employs that competent person would, would deem that and how you would do that is through 
training um, experience. So, uh, you know, with any of these systems, there's um, installation manuals, there's user manuals, there's maintenance manuals. So the PCBU responsible for that maintenance would, uh, would go through that training um, with, with the employee and would deem them um, competent. There's, there's no, um, you know, prescribed or legal, uh, requ well, there's a legal requirement for, comp for, for, for competence, but there's no, I guess there's no qualification required to, uh, to check that the, uh, the systems are operating correctly. You just need to be trained and competent and you would apply the same methodology as you do for every other um, element of training in, in a business. Yeah, thanks, Pete. And I guess you would very much go to the uh, supplier or the um, manufacturer. That's right. Uh, from that. Yeah. All right. Another question, uh, just a pretty simple one that James might get is, uh, where will we get this uh, info sheet? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, I think you mentioned this. We're going to be publishing it on Monday. All of our information will be available on the ewpa.com.au website. Um, and we don't lock this stuff away in a member area. It's freely available for anyone. And that goes for the good practice guide as well, which is probably the most comprehensive document that we, we produced. Um, so the secondary guiding um, document will be on the EWPA website from Monday. Okay. Thanks, James. Uh, I do urge everyone to get it to uh, download it and have a look. Question we'd have here is, um, regarding documents being sent to rental companies. And I'm not certain who's going to best answer it. it might be Pete again. Um, that uh, constru particular construction companies uh, have indicated from December, the 1st of December, that scissor lifts will uh, categorically uh, not be inducted without having secondary guarding. Uh, so does anyone want to talk about uh, these requirements coming from the from the user or from the construction company. I oh, Andrew, I'll, I'll have a go. Which is only just to um, to reiterate that that's that's our understanding that there are a number of construction companies in the country mandating um, these. You know, scissor lifts will need to have some sort of uh, operator protection system on them by December. That's really going to be up to them as to whether or not. They stick uh, to that that those dates, but um, we're operating underneath uh, you know the proviso that that's what's still occurring. I haven't heard any any change recently to um, those dates. Okay, thanks, Peter. And perhaps this will be the last question. Uh, there are a few more, and we'd like to take them off. Um, uh, we'll answer them all offline. But the last question, uh, I guess, James, who would again be best here is is what is the EWPA position on secondary guarding? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, the EWPA's position on secondary guarding, I would say that it plays a, an important role in safe operations um, where the risk assessment identifies a need. Um, but we do need to remember that secondary guarding should be used alongside planning, machine selection, risk assessments, training, familiarisation and supervision because these are all critical factors that need to be addressed when using MEWPs, um, whether the machine has got secondary guiding or not. I think, Andrew, um, that probably concludes the time that we've uh, allocated for this webinar this morning. Uh, I'd just like to thank uh, the panel today. Um, it's been a very informative um, discussion and uh, thank you all for dialing in as well. It's been some great questions. And as Andrew said, if we didn't get around to your question, in the webinar, we'll be sure to uh, email you back a uh, response afterwards. Well, that concludes today's webinar. Um, thanks to everyone who's dialed in and please feel free to contact the EWPA following this webinar if you need any more information. Also, the webinar will be made available on the EWPA's YouTube channel. And a reminder that the resources we discussed today are all freely available on our website, which is ewpa.com.au. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you. All the best.